We have gathered together to worship God, who has loved us throughout all time, before we were born and after. God knows us through and through, better than we know ourselves. God's love for all creation never ceases. God is always present with us as we inhale and as we exhale. Let us worship God this day, who dwells in us and all around us. Let us pray. O oh God, be with us in the stillness of our hearts. Be with us in the silence of our minds. Be with us, filling us with your presence, dear God. Blessed are you who made us. Blessed are you, for you offer us hope and new life. Blessed are you, O oh God of all. Your name is love, your presence is light, your heart is justice. Let every part of our being show that we are yours. May our lives resound with praise for you this day and always. Amen.
Welcome to worship at Central Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you are, you are indeed welcome here. It is so very good to gather together to worship our God through this virtual worship from the many places of our lives. If you are interested in learning more about Central, there will be a time to think about joining this community in the fall. Please call the church office and let them know if you are interested in that. The number is 401-331-1960. There are many opportunities for us to gather virtually this summer. If you're interested in any of these, please just let us know and we will make sure that you get connected. Our summer Bible study of Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther continues to meet via Zoom on Sunday mornings from 9.15 to 10 a.m. And it's not too late to join in. If you would like to join that group, please let us know. Um, also, I have two more books for $3 each. And if you'd like one of them, let me know and we'll figure out a way to get it to you. And Great and Small for Children, through grade five and their families continues to meet every Sunday from 1045 to 1115 for a half hour Zoom gathering to hear a story and to talk about each week's theme. And it's not too late to join in with your children or your grandchildren. Just let me know and I will send you the downloads and some more information. And that's not all. We have a women's retreat group that gathers every Saturday night at 7 p.m. Plus, Caring and Sharing continues to meet monthly via the magic of Zoom. There is indeed a lot going on, and I hope you will be part of it. That's all of our announcements for today. Let us continue our worship with our prayer of confession. Gracious God, it is so easy for us to focus on all the things that are wrong. We spend so much time and energy and anger and sorrow leaving behind the possibilities of hope and service to you. Ease our hearts, O oh God. Forgive us our willingness to get caught up in pessimism and in inaction. Direct our steps toward all that will produce growth and peace in your world. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God's seeds of love have already been sown in your midst. Come and see their growth in the love of God poured out for you. You are beloved of God, forgiven and set free from all that holds you back. Come, live in the light of God. Amen. I'm going to read two scriptures this morning. The first is Psalm 139 verses 1 through 12 and 23 through 24. O oh God, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh God, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me and it is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take my wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limit of the sea. Even there, your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the shadows shall cover me, and the light around me becomes night, even the night is not without light to you. The night is as bright as the day, for night is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart, Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The second reading is Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30 and 36 through 43. He put them before them another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the householder came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? Where then did these weeds come from? He answered, An enemy has done this. The slave said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, No, for in gathering the weeds you will uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Collect the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples approached him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers and they will throw them into the furnace of fire, where they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun of the kingdom of their father. Let anyone with ears listen. May God bless these readings to our hearing and understanding. I want to tell you a story about a garden today. More specifically, a garden at our house. At some points over the years, we should have called it the never-ending saga of the garden. When we moved into the house 35 years ago, there was a bed that ran along the side of the addition, and it had assorted shrubs, old shrubs that had been there for a long time as part of the landscaping. There was Wajila and Persithia and other nameless greenery. And these plants continued on for years, but they never really did much of anything. It was obvious that they needed to go. And so they finally did. By the way, the Wajila found itself a new home in Little Compton. Finally, my husband pulled this motley crew of shrubs out and planted the bed with wildflower seeds. They sprouted right up, and they looked great for the first year. By the second year, a lot of our pretty flowers were being choked out by weeds, some of them with rather pretty flowers on their stalks. More about that later. We decided that we would start again. This time, we bought seeds for perennial flowers that would attract butterflies and hummingbirds because we are great fans of both. They looked wonderful the first year, but by the second year, you guessed it, weeds. They took over again. So we tore up the second garden and we started all over one more time. We retilled the garden and this time we planted buckets with about 20 perennials hand-picked by our friend who owns a nursery. Eureka! We had done it! This is the third growing season of that garden, and while some plants didn't winter over in years one and two, most of them did, and they're thriving. And, by the way, the hummingbirds, and goldfinches and butterflies and bees love this garden. We love it too. It is a place of semi-wildly tangled beauty. Let us now turn to Jesus' parable in today's reading. Matthew tends to use judgmental language in his gospel. 
Thomas Long writes in his commentary on Matthew's gospel that Matthew's writing is stark, uncompromising, unequivocal pictures of good and bad, spiced up with plenty of weeding and gnashing of teeth. I don't know about you, but I really want to turn away from Matthew's jarring descriptions. And yet, there they are. And every third summer, we encounter this reading. And turning away is not really an option. Therefore, my friend Kate Matthews stops me short when she writes this. In response to our ancestors' struggle with the presence of evil in their midst, not so much why it was there, but what to do about it, Matthew provides pictures and promises to help them endure and persist, even if their little church and the big world beyond it seemed infected and flawed by bad seed, the weeds sown by a power at odds with God's vision for the world. There are, and there always have been, and there always will be, questions about why bad things happen not only in the time of the disciples, but in all the times which came before and after, and the times which will continue on from this very day. Let's face it, we all have questions in every age. Our early ancestors in the faith are no different than we are in trying to grapple with such questions. It is a familiar struggle in every age right down to our own, isn't it? Perhaps parables are more intended to grapple with the questions rather than to have the answers. In her wonderful sermon called Learning to Live with Weeds from her equally wonderful book called The Seeds of Heaven, Barbara Brown Taylor writes that parables give us their meaning in images that talk more to our hearts than to our heads. Parables are mysterious, she says. Left alone, they teach us something different every time we hear them, speaking across great distances of time and place and understanding. Parables are indeed very interesting. Very interesting because just when we think we've got it, we realize that they have more to teach us each and every time. Parables are not all sweetness and light, moral fables with which we tuck our children and ourselves into bed at night. Let's face it, this particular one is the stuff of terrifying nightmares. Parables wrestle with the hard realities of life. There are those in this world, in every time and place, who circumvent the good for their own purposes. How do we live in a world that is sometimes deliberately broken? This parable doesn't address the why of the weed sowing enemy, but it should make us wonder about what we are to do in our lives, and especially as we consider the events of the world in which we live. Are we to tear out the weeds, tossing them into the fire? This, by the way, was the ancient way of getting rid of weeds still is a way to get rid of weeds. Thomas Long writes that there is a purification in the idea of throwing them on the fire. Long says that we could see that fire as a purifying of all deadens humanity, all that deadens humanity, or all that corrupts God's world, a purifying factor. Long says whatever is in the world or in us that poisons our humanity and breaks our relationship with God will, thank the Lord, be burned up in the fires of God's everlasting love. Fred Craddock writes about the problems of attention with our desires, some of which verge on self-righteousness, to purge imperfection ourselves. And he says that the task of judging between good and evil belongs not to us, but to Christ. We can do work to make the world better, but in the end, it's Christ's choice to judge. 
This doesn't mean that we don't try to do things about the evils of this world. However, in that end, in the ultimate end, the ultimate judgment for those who do evil is God's and not ours. And I don't know about you, but that's a relief. In another sermon called Why the Boss Said No, Taylor writes that it doesn't matter how the weeds get there. Most of them have got them. Most of us have got them, she says, not only in our yards, but also in our lives. Thorny people who were not part of the plan, who are not welcome, sucking up sunlight and water that were meant for good plants, not the weeds. We are none of us always completely faithful. There are plants that are weedy, and there are humans who are weedy. Perhaps you've known some you could describe that way. Some people who simply take over. We contemplate what we should do about those with weedy traits. We've all known people who try to monopolize a room, who take over conversations and meetings and family gatherings, or who are just plain difficult. Or worse, we may have known those who sabotage other people's plans. Or perhaps weedy people who push others aside to get what they want. Or those who lack compassion and consideration or those who are bulldozers in the garden of life. There just may be a special place in the heart of God for such people who don't understand and who don't care what it means to live in community with those around them. God's compassionate call to all of us is always to be our very best selves rather than have any weediness about us. In the meantime, thankfully, we are not the ultimate judges. God alone does that. Yes, we try to remove those who need removal from our midst in society because they are dangerous to others. And we certainly work to make our world a more fair and equitable place and to call out wrong where we see it. That is our call as Christians. However, the final call and judgment is God's. Why? Because it is all too easy to pull out the wheat with the weeds, says the parable. Most importantly, we must remember that the seeds of good and bad lie within each one of us. Only God knows what's in our hearts. Albert Camus wrote, I shall tell you a great secret, my friend. Do not wait for the last judgment. It takes place every day. Every day, we are challenged by what is in our hearts, and we are invited to change the things that we need to change. Sometimes we are faithful, and sometimes we aren't, because we are human. So, what have we learned about weeds? Some of them are very beautiful in and of themselves, but they don't exactly play well with others especially the more tender varieties of flowering plants. The bad thing about weeds is that they tend to choke out all the plants around them. They don't want to coexist with others, but rather they take over. And when they do that, the others are no longer able to thrive. In fact, the other plants often cease to exist. Going back to our garden, we removed the mullen from our garden. Those are those great big tall spiky plants with yellow flowers and big leaves out of which their spires grow. We moved a couple of them over to a corner of the yard for the goldfinches because the goldfinches love them and the bees too. There they can live in peace by themselves. And by the way, I've read that a mullein stem can grow up to six feet tall. Ours are easily four feet high. You will often see mullen along the sides of a road or a highway. In fact, they're actually blooming right now, and they're very easy to spot. They're also very easy to grow. After all, they're weeds. And I understand that they actually have some historical medicinal properties, although I definitely cannot vouch for that. Sarah Owens wrote a book called Sourdough about rustic breads and sweets, and interestingly in it, she writes this. If weeds constantly overrun your garden rows, ask yourself what those are 
and why they are growing there. Put down the hoe long enough to consider what the weeds are telling you. Now, I haven't read her book, but isn't this a great quote? When weeds runneth over in our gardens of life, can we stop and consider them and maybe try to get inside their weedy little minds and try to figure out what they may be telling us or perhaps teaching us? Referencing the Reverend Jonathan Edwards' famous sermon from 1741, author Seth Adam Smith says, Perhaps we are not really sinners in the hands of an angry God after all. Perhaps we are all more like seedlings in the hands of a wise gardener. May it be so in all our lives. Amen. Let us gather our hearts in prayer. We give you thanks, O God, that you are always with us. Help us to feel your presence all around us. We look at the mighty power and majesty of nature, and it is easy for us to sing songs of praise for your creation. But then we look at the ways people treat one another. Too often, lying and cheating are prevalent in those we know or hear about. We see deceit and anger, hostility and hatred all around us and we long for times of peace and joy, and we shrink from the horrors of this world. Help us to place our trust in you and to work for your purposes in our corner of your world. For there is much work to be done, and we know you have called us to this work. Guide our steps and guard our lives. Stand us up again, O oh God. Dust us off and put us back on your pathways of service and hope. Warm our hearts as we pray that your love will lift our spirits with your power. And now we name in our hearts those people and situations in need of your powerfully healing touch. Gracious God, we thank you that you reach out to all those whom we have named. Help us to be witnesses to the power of Jesus Christ, for it is in his name that we pray together. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. One of the ways that we praise God is through the thankful ways that we live our very lives, including the gifts that we offer from our lives. And so we pray that God will receive all the offerings from our hands and our hearts, and that God will bless them and use them to bring hope and new life to all those who need such hope and new life in this place and throughout our world.
forth with confidence, nurturing seeds of hope, knowing that God will bring in the harvest in due time. And may the peace of Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be and abide with you from this day forward and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.